Welcome to the Hearst Trading Room Live. My name is David Hickson and today is the 13th of June 2016. Today we're going to be speaking about the exciting new feature in Sentient Trader, the composite model line. Uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting new feature and um, I have a lot to say about it. Uh, there's a lot of detail that I'd like to go into. Uh, it's a new line that Sentient Trader is able to plot on its charts and um, uh, there's quite a lot to understand about it. So I'm going to be moving as fast as I possibly can. Uh, if you need me to repeat anything or to clarify anything, please do ask in the chat box. I'll be very happy to do what I can to uh, answer all your questions and to clarify things. Please make sure that you have read and understood these disclaimers. They are important and they are legally obliged. In fact, one of these disclaimers has a particular pertinence to today's topic, the composite model line. I'm not going to tell you which one it is now, but uh, as you're looking through them, you might uh, spot one of them that has a, has a particular pertinence, that has a particular meaning to the composite model line, which we're going to be discussing. Uh, it has to do with something that I call the cycle trader's paradox, but I will be coming back to that later. And uh, and let's see uh, how many of you um, have chosen the correct disclaimer in terms of it being particularly pertinent to the the composite model line. So let's start speaking about the composite model line. I see a question already. Is this feature, the CML, available in all versions of the software? Uh, yes, Venkat, it is available in all versions of the software. Um, it is still currently in beta testing, but the beta testing um, period is rapidly coming to a close. Um, we are scheduled to release the new version of the software. All users of the software will be upgraded to the new version at the end of June. Um, and the good news is that we're actually um, a few days ahead of schedule. So by the end of June, all Sentient Trader users will be upgraded to the new version, which does include the CML. So uh, that's really good news. It's a powerful new tool, as you will uh, soon discover, that you will be able to um, use to better understand your analysis. So let's speak about the composite model line, or CML, as I like to call it. All these multi-syllable words can be a little daunting to get the right word at the right time. So I like to refer to it as the CML. What, what is the CML, and um, how does it work? Well, at its most basic level, the CML is simply another way of understanding the analysis that you have performed. So let's take a look at an analysis. This is an analysis of the S&P 500 cash index that we've been looking at over the past many weeks as we've been discussing moving from analysis to trading. This is uh, one of the analyses that we've been looking at. And uh, so by now, I'm sure that you are really uh, very familiar with with how all of this works. Uh, let me just zoom in on this chart and uh, remind you, particularly if you're new to Hearst Cycles, uh, what this all means. Uh, when we perform an analysis on a price movement of a financial market, then uh, what we're doing is we are analyzing the cycles in that price movement. It is what Hearst called a phasing analysis. Uh, because what you are doing is you are working out what phase each of the cycles is in. Now, uh, the phase of a cycle tells you how far along that cycle is. Uh, what is a cycle? Perhaps I should uh, spend just a moment discussing what a cycle is in terms of our understanding of cycles that influence uh, financial markets. A cycle is very simply something that influences price to move upwards uh, for a certain period of time and then it influences price to move downwards for a certain period of time, and then it repeats that process. So it moves up, and then it moves down, and it does that fairly regularly. That's what a cycle is, and uh, I expect that you, you are all fairly familiar with that concept. And, of course, we represent cycles as sine waves. That's a, a very rough approximation of a sine curve there, uh, because uh, that indicates how the cycle influences prices to move upwards and then downwards. So that's what a cycle is. What is a phasing analysis or the cyclic analysis that we perform? The phasing analysis involves 
basically uh, working out where the troughs of the various cycles that are active in the financial market formed and we plot the position of those troughs at the foot of the chart using these diamonds. I'll come back to that in a moment. I'm going to zoom in so you can see them more clearly. Uh, so that's the one thing we do is we work out where the troughs occurred in the market. And uh, sometimes that's really obvious because you get a nice clear trough. Uh, other times it's less obvious because you don't get very clear troughs. But the other thing that we work out uh, uh, in our phasing analysis process is that we uh, work out how far along each of these cycles is currently. Uh, that's the phase of the cycle. In other words, how many days, hours, minutes, or seconds has it been since the last trough of that particular cycle? Now, uh, the chart that you're looking at now, uh, let me just clear that pen. The chart that you're looking at now uses Hurst's diamond notation to uh, plot the uh, position of the troughs at the, at the foot of your chart. Okay, so um, here you can see these diamonds at the foot of the chart and those diamonds tell us the position of the troughs as they have been worked out in the analysis. Now, um, I'm very familiar uh, working with Hurst's notation, the diamond notation, and I can look at a chart and I can uh, understand what that analysis is telling me and I can uh, uh, you know, get a feeling for, for what, the, what the analysis is saying and what it means. But if you're new to Hurst Cycles, you're probably looking at that chart and you're thinking to yourself, I have no idea what all those diamonds mean. What on earth are they doing there at the, at the foot of that chart? And what are they actually uh, telling me? Well, um, let me just uh, make a small change here on this analysis because I want to... Uh, not get into discussions about the position of that 18-month cycle trough, which is probably going to cause some confusion. Uh, let me reanalyze there and see if we can position that 18-month uh, cycle trough in that position instead. Uh, so uh, Hurst's cycle notation involves diamonds to mark the position of troughs in the price movement. And then uh, to the right-hand side of the chart, you will see that the notation involves uh, circles, uh, what we call circles and whiskers. So here are the circles at the right hand side of the chart. The circles represent the uh, time that the next trough is expected. That's what the circle is and the whiskers are the lines to each side of, uh, of that circle and the lines represent the range of time in which we could reasonably expect that trough to occur because of the fact that the wavelengths of cycles are constantly varying. And so because the wavelengths of cycles are constantly varying, um, you don't expect cycles, cycle troughs to occur exactly on schedule. They will occur um, slightly earlier or slightly later than expected. And that is why that line or the whiskers um, are really useful. As a matter of interest, the term circle and whiskers is my own term. It was a term coined by um, some of the early beta testers of Sentient Trader uh, in Australia. There was a, an enthusiastic team of Australian Hearst cycle analysts who were working with Sentient Trader and they called those, um, those uh, circles the circles and whiskers and it's a term that's stuck and we still, still use it today. So uh, that's Hearst's uh, diamond notation, I call it Hearst's diamond notation, which uh, presents the result of uh, the analysis that you've performed. Now the analysis that you've performed doesn't involve identifying one single cycle and working out when that cycle is going up and down. That's because there are multiple cycles that influence the price movement of any financial uh, market. And so there are multiple cycles that you have to analyze in your price movement. And so uh, that is why there are so many diamonds at the at the foot of this chart okay 
Um, so where you get a prominent uh, trough, you get a big pile of diamonds underneath that trough. Here we've got an 18-month cycle trough, and we've got a big pile of diamonds underneath, representing the fact that there are many cycles that are forming troughs at that particular point. As a matter of interest, some people um, ask whether um, uh, how we determine what the multiple cycles are that, that we're analyzing in the market, and we use a thing called a nominal model, which is simply a list of cycles, but it's not a fixed uh, nominal model, it's not a, a, a list of, of fixed cycles. And um, uh, because each cycle experiences some variation, both in terms of wavelength and amplitude. Okay, so uh, having spent years uh, myself working with these charts and um, looking at the analyses, um, I became uh, very used to uh, understanding what the analysis was telling me was happening in the market. Uh, you can look at the past by looking at all the diamonds and you can say, okay, so there's a, a, an important trough and there are the diamonds underneath it and I can see that that is an 18-month cycle trough. And then in terms of looking ahead to the future, you look at these circles and whiskers at the right-hand edge of the chart. And so if we uh, zoom in again, uh, then you will see, and in fact, let's just zoom in like that, then you will see that the circle and whiskers tend to form stacks on top of each other. These stacks are called nests of lows, and they tell us the times that we expect uh, future troughs of various cycles to form in the market. So I'm very used to looking at that and uh, looking at that information at the foot of the chart. I'm able to work out what I'm expecting to happen. What I'm expecting to happen here is price will come down into um, this 40-day uh, cycle trough over here, and then it'll bounce up, and then it'll come down into this 80-day cycle trough over here. And I've spent many years sort of drawing squiggles all over the chart, showing what I'm expecting to happen as a result of that uh, analysis at the foot of the chart. But uh, the fact is, in, in today's uh, sort of modern era, where people are constantly uh, looking for improved user, uh, user interfaces and improved me methods for uh, conveying information, uh, I realized that the diamond notation uh, has actually um, become a notation that is slightly outdated. It doesn't really give us some very useful information right at the tip of our fingers. And there's a huge amount of information that we get from any phasing analysis. So I started looking at ways that we could express this information uh, slightly differently or show it uh, on the chart. So um, the composite model line is the result of that quest of trying to find a better way of presenting the information or it's another way of understanding the analysis that we have performed so what is the composite model line well there are uh, three words in there of course uh, so let's start um, let's start at the end uh, with the word line. The composite model line is is very simply a line that is uh, plotted on your chart and that line represents a model. What is a model? Uh, the, the model is, is a model for the price movement. And it is a composite model because it is composed of various cycles. So let's break this down. Um, in the software, we are building a model which is composed of various different cycles. So here we have a trough analysis, and if I zoom all the way out like that, um, having performed this analysis, uh, we can work out where the troughs are of each cycle, of course, and we are therefore able to start building a model uh, with that cycle information. So what the software does is it takes the information about... Um, one or more of the cycles and it will present it on the chart. So let's take a look at a very simple composite model line. There it is. Perhaps it doesn't look very exciting, doesn't look very interesting to you, but that orange line is a very simple, very basic composite model line. That is a model of the price movement 
built out of the information of only one cycle. And that cycle is the 18-month cycle. Now, in Sentient Trader, we can also view our cycle uh, or analysis information using these semicircles. And the semicircles are a slightly more intuitive way of understanding what the cycles are doing because we can see, uh, you know, the, the semicircles come down to a low point at the trough and then they bounce up to a high point and then they come down to a, another low point. And so you can see the results of the analysis at the foot of the chart using these semicircles. But the composite model line um, takes uh, that, that idea one step further and it presents the result of the analysis uh, right up there at the level of price and it presents um, the results of combining the cycles that you have selected. That's an important point. And we're going to spend some time speaking about that. Which cycles do you select and, and how, how do you do this? But at the moment, this a composite model line is very simply um, the result of taking only one cycle, in this case the 18-month cycle, and um, building a model out of that cycle. And so what information does it use to build that model? Well, it uses the information that it has about uh, all of these cycles in the price movement. The information that it has is the wavelength for each iteration or wave of the cycle as well as the amplitude for each iteration or wave of that cycle. So in our composite model line that we see over here you can see that at this point the model is showing us a trough in price then a move up up to a peak over here then a move down to a trough over here. How much is it moving up and down? That is called the amplitude of the cycle. So uh, during this period of time on the left of the chart, that's in 2009, 2010, 11, and about tw 2012, the amplitude of the 18-month cycle was fairly high. Okay. Uh, you will notice that the, the height of these curves diminishes drastically as we move over to the right-hand side of the chart. What does that mean? That means that the amplitude of the 18-month cycle has been steadily uh, declining. You can see it's been gradually getting smaller and smaller. So the 18-month cycle has been getting less and less powerful over the time of the analysis that we're viewing on the chart here. Um, Najmuddin says, is this 18-month uh, month CML the band pass filter to extract the 18-month wave? Uh, no, Najmuddin, it's not. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a fairly common mis misperception about what the composite model line is, which is why this uh, webinar is uh, um, r so important. Uh, there are various ways of extracting cycle information, and one of them, as you've mentioned, is to is to perform a band pass filter. So you uh, run a band pass filter th uh, through your data that extracts cycle information, and you can plot the uh, you can pl plot the results of the band pass filter uh, usually at the foot of the chart. Um, uh, uh, th there are many software packages that perform band pass filters to great degrees of complexity and um, uh, uh, Sentient Trader, uh, we decided not to take that approach, not because it's uh, an invalid approach, it's an extremely valid approach, but what we decided to do was to take the, r the information that results from the analysis that Sentient Trader has already performed and take that information and present it to you on the chart. As William says, it is very close. Absolutely, it is very close. What uh, Sentient Trader is doing is it is taking the results of the analysis that have been performed. And the results of that analysis, as I've mentioned, are an understanding or a, or a, or a knowledge of the wavelength of each of these cycles, each of these waves. Sentient Trader is able to, to very simply calculate the wavelength. Okay, so it knows the wavelength. It then uses a cycle subtraction process um, to identify or calculate the amplitude for each one of those waves. It then takes that information and presents it to you in the form of the CML or the composite model line. 
Okay, so I hope that um, clarifies that. Um, a very, very interesting and useful process to do, I believe, is to is to compare the CML with the results of a of a band pass filter analysis. It's a it's a it's a very interesting comparison to make. Um, uh, there's not going to be time to sort of go into uh, detail about that uh, just now. Uh, perhaps later, if we have time, we can we can discuss that a little bit. Okay, so uh, here we have the most simple. Um, uh, uh, the most simple possible composite model, which is a model that consists of only one cycle. It is the 18-month cycle. Um, let's zoom all the way out, and we can have a look at um, um, some other uh, interesting things. Let me uh, show you this quickly. While we're looking at the 18-month cycle, uh, I've zoomed out here, and you can see how the amplitude of the 18-month cycle has v has uh, varied over time. And if you have a look at the price action uh, underneath that composite model, you will notice that when the amplitude of the 18-month cycle is is large, such as over here, then you tend to get fairly good, clear 18-month cycles in the in the data. Um, uh, so in the in the price movement. So uh, let me just uh, erase that that there. So during this period here, we had good strong amplitude for the 18 month cycle. And what do we see in the in the price movement? We see some fairly good clear up and down moves for that 18 month cycle. Whereas this period of time over here shows a very reduced, much lower amplitude for the 18-month cycle. And what's happening during this period? Well, uh, as you can see over here, um, it's very difficult to see very strong, clear 18-month cycles. Now, you might say, but hang on, I am seeing some clear cycles in there. Uh, let's zoom in. Uh, you know, I am uh, clearly seeing uh, some very strong, clear cycles. Yes, you are, but they probably are not the 18-month cycles that you are seeing in there. So what we can do is we can add another cycle to our composite model. And now we're looking at a composite model that is created as a combination of the 18-month and the 40-week cycle. Okay, so um, let's just uh, zoom out and and build us uh, build ourselves a composite model. And let's go all the way out and let's zoom in and let's build a composite model the way that uh, I would recommend approaching any analysis. So let's uh, take off those cycles and let's add in uh, a 54 month cycle. Uh, so now with this 54 month cycle on the composite model, here we can see a fairly good clear model using only one cycle. This is the 54 month cycle. And uh, I think you can see how uh, during this period of time, from over here up to uh, over here, the 54-month cycle composite model shows you fairly closely what price was doing over that period of time. Not very closely, obviously, because we're only looking at one cycle. But it is giving you, um, it's, it's, it's giving you the, the sort of skeleton structure. Uh, and this is how the composite model line works. Uh, what you do is you should start with the bigger cycles so that you can understand how those bigger cycles have been uh, working uh, in the market. And uh, then you can add in uh, some of the shorter cycles and um, you will then also probably want to add in some longer cycle information. So uh, let's add to this composite model and let's start adding some shorter cycles. Here's the 18 month cycle and so now we have a composite model that consists of two cycles the 54 month and the 18 month using the information that is in there in the analysis. Now uh, let's, add, uh, let's add the 40 week uh, cycle information as well. You will notice that each time we add another cycle, another shorter cycle, we get a few more sort of squiggles in here. We get a bit more detail in the composite model. The other thing that will, that will really stand out is that if from this period of time, 1998, um, all the way up until over here, 2011, if you had been trading only on the basis 
of the um, composite model built out of the 54-month, the 18-month, and the 40-week cycles, then you would have done fairly well because, uh, you know, you would have been buying at the low prices, selling at the high prices, buying at the low, selling at the high. That wasn't perfect timing at all because the high is displaced. We're going to speak about that in a moment. And uh, here you're going to uh, buy at the trough and sell at the high. Um, so, you know, so you, you would have done pretty well over that 13-year period. But what happened over here? The composite model line is going down and price is going up. So we have a clear uh, situation for that, um, what's that, about a, about a two-year period where the composite model line is not reflecting what is happening in the price movement. Then we had uh, this strong price move up, uh, forming a peak over there, which is uh, round about um, the beginning of this year. So the composite model line based only on these cycles is indicating that we should have expected a peak um, of these cycles around about the beginning of this year. Okay, I see another question. Uh, Najmuddin says the 18-month cycle is increasing amplitude in the future. How can the software know that? Uh, well, it doesn't know that, of course, um, but I will speak in a moment about uh, what the software does in terms of moving into the future. Okay, it's a very uh, important, very critical aspect of, the, of understanding the composite model line. Okay, so um, let's... Uh, so we have a composite model here which represents the results of our cycle analysis and to some extent it follows price fairly closely but there are times as I've pointed out between 2011 and 2013 where price just really seems to contradict what's happening um, in that in that composite model line so uh, let's turn off our composite model line and let's just zoom in and take a look at something in a little more detail here. And um, in fact, what I will do, let me see if I turn off that phasing. Let's build a composite model line now um, out of only the 40-day cycle. So now we're, we're simply looking at the beats of the 40-day cycle. Okay. Um, the 40-day cycle is a cycle that I like to trade. So, so here's the basic idea. When the composite model line is forming a trough, that indicates that the 40-day cycle is forming a trough, so then you would buy. Uh, when it forms a peak, you would sell if you're trading the 40-day cycle. And so you would have made a profitable trade there to catch that move up. Then the 40-day cycle moves down, and it moves down, and you would have made another profitable trade. Then the composite model line moves up and so you would have made another profitable trade then again things go wrong can you see that the composite model line is moving down but price is moving up this is a a very important uh, uh, concept to understand your composite model line is presenting you with the results of your information and it's presenting us with in this example information about what the 40-day cycle is doing and only the 40-day cycle. If we add in uh, some other cycles then of course we can uh, consider what a combination of cycles are doing. And so uh, if I add in a whole lot of uh, other cycles then I get some more detailed information about what the combination of all those cycles is actually doing in the market. But why is it that sometimes the composite model line is going downwards and price is going upwards? The reason for that is because there are multiple cycles that are being combined to influence price movement. It's one of the very important principles of Hearst cycles that there are multiple cycles that influence the price movement. And so when the 40-day cycle is dropping, the 40-day cycle itself is influencing price to fall. But price might still rise because of the longer cycles. It's a very, very important concept. So let's uh, turn off that composite model line, go all the way back out again, and um, consider the longer-term picture again. Now, um, let's turn on our composite model line for the 54-month uh, cycle. And 
ask ourselves uh, what's actually happening over here when the composite model line indicates that the 54-month cycle is dropping and price was clearly rising. What was happening there? Well, it's the influence of the other cycles. In particular, it's the influence of the longer cycles. Now, how many cycles are there that influence the price movement of financial markets? The bad news is that there are an infinite number of cycles that influence uh, price movement. So um, that's really bad news because it means there are a lot of cycles that we need to consider. And we've performed an analysis that uh, here goes all the way up to, I think this is an analysis that goes up to the nine-year cycle. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we can turn on our, our nine-year cycle, uh, add that to our composite model, and there we have the results of, uh, uh, of combining the nine-year cycle with the 54-month cycle. Uh, you can see that, again, by adding extra cycles into the model, we reach something that is a little closer to what price is doing, but there are still some glaring errors and glaring problems in there. And the most glaring uh, uh, sort of problem between this composite model line and price is this period of time here, from the beginning of 2012 until... Uh, mid-2013, during that time the composite model line was dropping, indicating that the combination of the 9-year and 54-month cycles, as measured by the software, uh, the combination of those two cycles were influencing price to fall. Price, however, as you can see, was not falling during that time. It was going upwards. Why? Because of the longer cycles. So how do we deal with that? Because we don't know what the longer cycles were doing. Well, we can look back and we can say, okay, so the longer cycles were clearly going up. But uh, how can we deal with that at the time without the benefit of hindsight? How can we say, what were the longer cycles doing? Well, um, Hurst suggested that we uh, work out the combined effect of all longer cycles, which was something that he called Sigma L. Okay, Sigma is the um, mathematical, um, it's, the, it's the Greek letter, it's, it's, it's used in mathematics to represent the sum of, it looks something like that, and um, it represents the sum of uh, a whole lot of things, and um, Sigma L means or represents the sum of all cycles longer, that's why the L is in there, L for longer, all cycles longer than the longest cycle that we have in our analysis. So um, this was Hurst's way of dealing with the concept of um, uh, you know, the infinite number of cycles that are longer than the longest cycle that we're actually able to look at in our, uh, in our data, in our analysis. So we've analyzed in this particular chart uh, all the way up to um, the nine-year cycle, as I've mentioned. Uh, what about all those longer cycles? Those longer cycles were pushing price up in 2012 and 2013. We need to know about them. Hurst recommended that, that you work out what the combined effect of all the longer cycles uh, is, and that combined effect he called sigma L, the sum of the longer cycles. Now, when we started working on creating the composite model line, it became apparent that we needed to, uh, to deal with the concept of sigma L. And when we started working on it, um, we discovered something very interesting. Uh, let me go back to the chart. We started extracting the value of sigma L, which, was, which is, of course, the sum of all the longer cycles than the longest cycle in your analysis. My longest cycle in this analysis is the nine-year cycle. So we were looking for information about cycles longer than the nine-year cycle. Uh, uh, here we're only looking at a period of, of, of about 18 years worth of data and so looking for cycle information for cycles longer than the nine year cycle when you're only looking at 18 years worth of data is actually quite a hard thing to do um, but we uh, developed various algorithms for calculating sigma L in the process of doing that we discovered something very interesting 
And at this point, I should tell you, I, I'm going to start speaking about some ideas that go way beyond what Hearst defined or spoke about. So if you're a Hearst purist, um, uh, you, you, you might disagree with some of the things that I'm going to say. And if you're a newcomer to Hearst, you should be aware that the ideas I'm going to speak about now aren't genuine Hearst. I'm, I, I like to feel that I sort of carry the torch of Hearst. I'm a great believer in Hearst. And I'm trying to make it very clear when I'm expressing ideas that, that are my ideas and not Hearst's ideas. And this is one of those ideas. So um, if this idea doesn't work for you, uh, that's no problem. But it doesn't mean that you disagree with Hearst. It means that you disagree with me, perhaps. Okay, uh, you will see that I have mentioned there something called Sigma U. And uh, that's it over there. That's because when we started extracting values for sigma L, looking for the sum of all the longer cycles, we found higher frequency information that was not accounted for by the shorter cycles and um, was too high frequency really to be a part of the longer cycles. Uh, it was not purely random movement you might assume that perhaps that's just random movement that we were picking up. It was not purely random movement. I won't go into detail. We don't have time, unfortunately. Um, but we discovered uh, information that uh, was clearly cyclical in some regards, um, but it was too high frequency to really be considered to be sigma L. And so we created a term sigma U, which is the sum of all unknown elements that are contributing towards the price movement. Um, as a matter of interest, we only uh, considered um, a, a sigma u that, you know, that was sort of um, uh, influences to price movement longer than um, our longer cycles in the analysis. So we're not speaking about random movements that happen from day to day. We're not uh, speaking about that kind of unknown influence on price movement. I'm speaking about unknown influences that take place over, over several months, several years, if you, if you have enough data. Uh, what is the sigma u? Well, I have some interesting ideas uh, for what sigma u is. Uh, in the mean, uh, quickly, as we speak about it, let me show you a chart um, now, this chart is a, is a chart that you can actually uh, plot quite easily in Sentient Trader, and I'll, I'll mention in a, in a moment um, uh, how you could do that. Um, uh, but here you can see the combination of, of two sine waves. Can you see that? Unfortunately, they're both the same color. Uh, the reason they're both the same color is because they actually both belong to the same cycle. And uh, so here is a solid line. Um, and here is a dashed line. The dashes aren't very clear. I apologize for the fact that it's not, not a lot clearer. But I hope you can see that there, there are two sine waves there. And they're fairly closely correlated. They move with quite a good deal in common. And in fact, if we very roughly work out their wavelengths, you will see that there are five trough to trough um, distances for the um, solid cycle. And there are five peak-to-peak -peak distances for the peak cycle, or for the for the dashed cycle. Okay, um, so those cycles have a fairly similar wavelength. Uh, what we discovered happens in the market, or at least ap appears to happen in the market, is that it seemed as if though for every single cycle that we found in the market, it seemed as if though sometimes there was a syncopated beat for that cycle. What do I mean by syncopated beat? Well, I mean you would have what seemed to be a trough, and then you would seem to have another trough, perhaps of the same cycle. Uh, here you would have a peak, and then you would have another peaked peak. You see what I mean? That's a, that's a syncopated beat. Instead of going trough, peak, trough, peak, it would go trough, trough, peak, peak, trough, trough, peak, peak. Or sometimes it would go trough, trough, peak, peak trough, peak, and so on. Okay, <laughs> not a very good musical interpretation of syncopated cycles, but um, I hope you get the idea. We discovered uh, clear evidence and um, 
uh, there isn't time for me to go into too much detail about it here, but we discovered uh, evidence that our sigma, uh, sigma U that we were tracking, which were higher frequency uh, movements, but movements which were nevertheless clearly cyclical, uh, how did we know they were clearly cyclical? Because they always fitted into uh, a harmonic pattern with the cycles we knew were active in the market. So we would find these sort of higher frequency syncopated beats. Um, what was happening? Well, uh, we spent a lot of time um, thinking about it, discussing it um, uh, with the various people we were uh, working with in terms of uh, understanding how these cycles were working and in terms of extracting a valid value for sigma L. And um, what we ended up doing was uh, exploring an interesting idea about how cycles work in financial markets, which is the concept of a dual analysis. Uh, or the fact that there are uh, dual cycles working together in the market. Now, I'm going to say again, this is not original Hearst material. This is um, my uh, extension on Hearst's material. I hope you find it interesting. Um, but it's not, it's not uh, something that Hearst originally stated. Uh, basically, what I propose happens in the markets is that there are, uh, for every cycle in our nominal model, there are in fact two cycles. So for every 54-month cycle that we see working in the markets, there are in fact two 54-month cycles. I know that sounds really a bit overwhelming and confusing, but let me explain to you how this seems to work. The one cycle, the one 54-month cycle, uh, causes troughs to form in the market and uh, that is the 54 month cycle that we uh, uh, are very used to uh, looking at and speaking about and considering and uh, all that kind of thing and at the same time there is another 54 month cycle which is influencing the formation of peaks in the market now those, 50, those two 54 month cycles have very similar wavelengths but they are not identical wavelengths. And those two cycles um, expand at different times and contract at different times, creating a very complex pattern of syncopated cycles. Okay, let's um, explore this idea a little bit. Uh, let me show you a different chart here in Sentient Trader. This is a chart that is now capable of performing what we call a dual analysis. A dual analysis uh, analyzes not only where the troughs um, uh, of particular cycles form in the market, but it also identifies where the peaks form in the market. Now, if you're new to this concept, uh, then let me just clarify something for you. Um, the obvious way of finding the peak for a cycle is to have a look at where the trough formed for that cycle, find the highest price. So let's find the, 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 the peak of this nine-year cycle that elapsed from here to here. The peak of that nine-year cycle is the highest price, which is clearly over here. So that's the peak of that nine-year cycle. Similarly, the peak of the 54-month cycle uh, is also there. So it's a synchronized peak. Um, that is also, as it happens, the peak of uh, this 18-month cycle over here. Okay, um, uh, Peaks are not always synchronized. We know from Hurst's cyclic principles, but uh, they very often are synchronized, of course. So you'll find that the peaks of multiple cycles occur at exactly the same time. Um, so the the sort of standard approach, the simple approach to understanding your analysis is to say, well, here are, here are where the troughs formed in the market, and uh, you know here are the respective peaks of those various cycles, and so you identify your peaks and you say, you know that's the peak of of whatever that cycle is over there. That's an eighteen month cycle. Perhaps that's the peak of the eighteen month cycle or the fifty four month cycle. So you find the highest price, and that's the peak of that cycle. Now. Um, of course, that's an approach that, that I've used for years, and it's an approach we use when we're trading, is we identify the peak of the cycle, and we use price crossing the FLD and the VTL to confirm the formation of that peak and so forth. Um, but it's not adding any new information to your analysis. After we discovered um, what I was calling sigma U, the sum of 
unknown influences on prices and discovered that they were clearly related to harmonic um, patterns that were forming between the longer cycles. And there seemed to be a syncopated beat. We introduced the concept of performing a dual analysis, which means that now the software can perform a peak analysis and a trough analysis. And these analyses are separate analyses. What that means is that when the software performs the peak analysis, it doesn't identify this nine-year cycle peak by saying, okay, when was the trough? There was the trough, and there was the next trough. Where's the highest price? That's the highest price. Therefore, that is a nine-year cycle peak. It doesn't do that. It assumes that there are, are actually different cycles that are beating and are creating peaks in the market. Okay, it's what we call a dual analysis, and um, the result is that um, uh, we have two understandings of each cycle. <laughs> let me explain. Let me explain uh, why. Um, if you have a look at the right-hand edge of this chart, let me just zoom in. <clears throat> oh, let me turn off those semicircles. They get really horribly confusing. Um, if you have a look at the right-hand edge of this chart, you can see the recent wavelength of each of these cycles. The recent wavelength, I better not draw over them because then you're not going to be able to read them. The recent wavelength of the nine-year cycle in terms of peaks is 7.6 years. The recent wavelength of the nine-year cycle in terms of troughs is 8.7 years. My proposal is that, in fact, the nine-year cycle is um, is, a, is a kind of a split cycle and is in fact two cycles which um, together um, uh, exhibit the characteristics of a 7.6 year cycle and an 8.7 year cycle. Now we can speak for hours about that, just this one concept and, I'm, and I expect many of you will want to, um, but uh, let's get back to the composite model line. I, I was speaking about uh, the fact that when you have a look, when you're building your composite model, you need to work out what the longer cycles are doing. So here is our um, uh, here's our analysis we were looking at with uh, with only troughs, and so we need to think about the longer cycles to understand the periods of time when the composite model line is dropping and price is rising, or vice versa. Okay, uh, it's the longer cycles that tend to cause those kinds of uh, issues in the in the uh, uh, in the market discrepancies between your composite model line and your price movement. And so, what you do is you work out what is the sum of all the longer cycles. And um, I mentioned that we initially started working with uh, with two separate entities, the sigma L and sigma U, having. Uh, worked out that actually probably what is happening is that there are two cycles that are running very close to one another but are slightly out of sync with one another. We abandoned the concept of calculating a separate sigma u and we now in Sentient Trader um, only work out a combined sigma l line. Or we, we work out what sigma l is and has been in the market. So um, I see Piotr says this needs some time to digest. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm throwing you a huge amount of new information at all of you. <laughs> You're probably sitting there um, uh, feeling a little, um, uh, pe perhaps a little confused. Um, but um, uh, I, hope, I hope you're going to find uh, after digesting this information that um, it provides you with a whole new way of looking looking at, um, at, at financial markets. Um, I've got to say, um, I've, it's revolutionized the way that I approach financial markets. Um, it's, uh, okay, uh, Piotr says, where could I read some more about Sigma L and Sigma U? Um, Piotr, you, uh, at the moment you can't. In fact, um, this work that I'm presenting today, I know I'm sort of throwing it all at you today in, in today's webinar, but it's a result of um, the last five years of work that, that I've um, been doing. I am in the process of putting it all down in writing and uh, will be uh, publishing some information about it. Um, uh, so at the moment, I'm afraid you can't actually read about it. Um, you can, you're welcome to speak to me about it um, and we can throw ideas around. But I, I will soon be publishing um, uh, some more sort of detailed uh, information about all of this. 
Uh, Najmuddin says the wavelengths are different even for the shorter cycles in the dual analysis. So will it not impact the shorter analysis also? Najmuddin, absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and it, it happens all the way down to your shorter cycles. In fact, I, I wish I had time to show you in today's webinar how it affects your intraday cycles. Really, um, really fascinating. It, it affects your intraday cycles. Um, uh, in a in a very big way. So yes, it affects all cycles. This concept of a dual analysis. Um, unfortunately, I don't have have time to um, you know, give you all the detail today. But in future webinars, I'm going to try to start including some more of this information. I, I've sort of um, not um, spoken much about it now because I know it can be a little overwhelming to have all this thrown at you. But it, it's an important aspect of the common of the composite model line. William says easily explainable in terms of Hurst. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Yes, well, um, of course, my whole uh, um, journey of discovery um, has always been firmly rooted in Hurst. So, um, all these uh, principles are, are perhaps just extensions of of Hurst's original work. Uh, so, let's get back to our composite model line. <coughs> Uh, let's have a look at our line over here and let's add some more cycles to this line and um, and then uh, let's consider what we can do about the sigma L which is the sum of all the longer cycles so here's a combination of all of the cycles that we know in our analysis but there are clearly some sort of divergences there are some some problems you can see them I don't really need to draw circles around them and so the answer to those divergences is almost certainly in sigma L. So let's have a look at how uh, Sentient Trader um, actually uh, works out these cycles and can present these cycles to you. Uh, here is the information that Sentient Trader has about these cycles. Okay, uh, so here is the cycle for the 54-month cycle. Uh, here's the cycle line for the 54-month cycle. That's the information that Sentient Trader has worked out on the basis of its analysis uh, for the 54-month cycle. And we can have we can have a look at all of our cycles here, and we can see uh, you, you know we can see how how they change. You can see how the amplitude of these uh, cycles changes, and um, how the wavelength changes over time, and and all that kind of thing. Um, now, let's have a look at what Sentient Trader has calculated for Sigma L. Here is what Sentient Trader has calculated for Sigma L, and I know there are probably a hundred questions about how it calculates it. Calculating Sigma L is a, is a really complex uh, subject and it deserves several webinars all to itself. I'm not going to bore you with all of the details here, but Sentient Trader uses an algorithm to extract Sigma L, or in fact, as you now know, what is really a combination of Sigma L and Sigma U. Uh, the sum of all sort of unknown things, or in my opinion, the combination of two syncopated, closely related cycles. So here is sigma L. Uh, it's a cycle line, as you can see, it's very similar to the other cycle lines, but it doesn't have a fixed wavelength. Why? Because it is a combination of of all the longer cycles. But you can see clear evidence of the fact that there are, you know, there are still cycles in there. But let's do something interesting and let's measure the wavelength that we can see there. Uh, so if I measure from this trough um, to this trough over here, I get uh, 73 point something months, 73.6 months. That's six years. Now the longest cycle in this analysis is in fact the nine year cycle. So why does it look as if the sigma L has a six year cycle in it? Well, that is, in my opinion, what I call sigma u. Notice something else, that uh, over here we have a trough in sigma l, and over here we have another trough. Syncopated cycle, anybody? Does that look like a perhaps a syncopated uh, trough between two closely related cycles? What about over here? We get a peak, and then we get another peak. Okay, I must point out that as you move towards the right hand edge of the chart, as you move towards the current time, the calculation of sigma L becomes less and less accurate. Very important thing to remember. And um, I'm going to get to the point soon where I'm going to speak about how you use the, co the composite model line for your trading. A very important thing to do, in my opinion, is to leave sigma L out of your calculations because sigma L calculations, as you approach your, the current time, become less and less accurate. Really, really important point. 
Okay, so that is um, that is sigma L as calculated uh, by Sentient Trader for this particular analysis. So now what happens when we add sigma L into our composite model line, and we'll do that uh, over here, and let me turn off those cycle lines. Now by simply adding the sigma L in there, you can see that some of the very big discrepancies between the overall movement of your composite model line and the price movement have been eradicated. Not all of them, of course. You know, we've still got some, some big discrepancies here. That period there, that period there, there's a big discrepancy over there. So not all of your discrepancies are eradicated by the application of sigma L. Because not all of the differences between your composite model line or your composite model and the price movement can be attributed to sigma L, which is the sum of all the longer cycles, including any syncopated beats you might want to consider and so forth. So we still have some discrepancies, like that whole period there in 2009, 2010. Price did not follow the composite model line closely at all. But adding sigma L, and let me just uh, display sigma L again for you so you can see what's, what Sentient Trade is using as sigma L. Uh, let me press that button again. doesn't seem to want to do it. Um, uh, this is what Sentient Trader is adding as Sigma L. It is a slowly moving curve, which of course Sigma L should be. But it has a few slightly high frequency fluctuations in there, because in my opinion of the whole concept of a dual analysis or, or two cycles that uh, have very closely related uh, wavelengths. See, Najm no, wouldn't say it's basically sigma L seems to have cyclic components outside the nominal model. That's absolutely correct, Najm no, uh, uh, That's That's really what it is. And that's why I called it sigma U when I started working with this, because I was expecting to see the combination of, of longer cycles. And I, I still remember when I first started plotting sigma L on my charts, which was uh, oh, about four years ago, I, I started plotting sigma L on the charts, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting and it's really wrong because uh, you know I was looking for the longer cycles so why I, why am I seeing all these other fluctuations and that's why that's why I came up with the concept of sigma u this is the sum of unknown uh, quantities okay um, let's uh, I'm really beginning to run short on time but let me let me show you on a chart that has a dual analysis how you can play around with some of these concepts and and get to understand them um, because uh, I know you're going to want to uh, do a lot of this and you're going to want to you know, really understand um, what's happening with these cycles. So um, let's show some cycle lines here on this analysis. Now this analysis has a dual, uh, uh, and this chart has a dual analysis on it. So um, we can look at the cycle lines um, for the 18 month cycle for instance. So uh, here are, are the cycle lines for the 18-month cycle based on the trough analysis. Okay, there you can see your increasing and decreasing amplitude, uh, your varying wavelength, and uh, all those various things. And now um, let me uh, show you the combination of both these analyses, which then plots a dual cycle line. Now, I'd like to point out something really interesting about the, this dual cycle line. There are periods of time where the two cycles seem to be pretty much in sync, like this period of time over here. I hope you can see that. Uh, they're pretty much in sync. The troughs and peaks are slightly displaced, but they're mostly in sync. When that happens, you tend to get the cycle that you are looking at as a dominant cycle in the market. This is the 18-month cycle, so the chances are that the 18-month cycle was fairly dominant in the market at that time. On the other hand, you get periods of time where the cycles are completely out of sync. Can you see that? Where literally the peak is happening at the same time as the trough, and the trough is happening at the same time as the peak. They are completely out of sync. What happens then? Well, when that happens, the cycle appears to disappear from your uh, from your price movement. That sounded like a poem. It wasn't meant to be. Um, when you see the cycles shifting out of phase like that, uh, 
then the cycle itself seems to disappear from the price movement. It's a, a very useful thing to know because then you can use that information to work out um, uh, you know, which cycle you're expecting to be dominant or which cycle was dominant uh, in the past. And um, let me point out something else about the combination of these two analyses. That is that the amplitude of the cycle in both analyses tends to move fairly closely. Can you see that? Uh, you know, both, both analyses uh, um, you know, are sort of swelling in amplitude at the same time and diminishing at the same time. And there we go. So uh, that's a very useful uh, thing to bear in mind. And in particular, it's a piece of information that you can apply to work out what on earth is going on in the cycle at the moment. And so let me quickly zoom in here. We're looking at the 18-month cycle, let me remind you. And uh, here, the trough-based cycle line, which is that solid yellow line, the amplitude has come down to nearly nothing. You can hardly see the 18-month cycle in there. Okay, it's a very small amplitude cycle. However, the dashed line, which is the result of the peak analysis cycle, uh, also the 18-month cycle, is still fairly, fairly high. Why is that? It's because Sentient Trader doesn't yet have enough information to adjust the amplitude for the current cycle. Why? Let's have a look at what's happening in the peak phasing uh, over here. Can you see what cycle is expected to form now in the market? This is a nest of highs. It's the 18-month cycle. So the 18-month cycle has gone fairly far. You know, we're, we're getting really close to the peak of the 18-month cycle. And as a result, the calculation of the amplitude for the most recent 18-month cycle um, uh, has not been confirmed yet. It's, it's an estimate and it is likely to be incorrect. What is more likely is that that um, amplitude should be reduced to the same level as the trough analysis amplitude. I hope that makes sense. Gosh, I feel like I'm throwing a huge amount of information at you. Um, uh, but these cycle lines are really, really useful in my opinion. So, um, so that's something else to look, f look for. Uh, when you have a reduced amplitude in one of the cycles and not in the other, the chances are one of them is probably wrong. In this case, I think it's probably the peak analysis, which means what? It means we probably are not going to get much more upwards movement out of the out of the current move. Uh, let me, before I um, move away from these cycle lines, let me show you the 40-week cycle lines. Um, because the 40-week cycle lines are really very interesting. We've been discussing uh, recently in the past few webinars how the 40-week cycle has been dominant in the market. Uh, what did I say about when a cycle is dominant in the market? That the two analyses tend to sit almost on top of each other. Can you see that? How the 40-week cycle lines are sitting almost on top of each other, whereas during this period of time over here, they were almost completely contradictory, meaning we did not have a dominant 40-week cycle during late 2013, early 2014, but we have definitely had a high amplitude dominant 40-week uh, cycle um, uh, at the end of 2015, and we're probably still in the grips of a dominant 40-week cycle. I see uh, some other questions there. Um, Najmuddin, there is a notion that cycles invert sometimes. Could that be the reason for the fluctuations in sigma L? Uh, yes, and in fact, there's a oh gosh, there's a really big discussion we can have about this in terms of inverted cycles. I believe one of the reasons why you uh, sometimes get inverted cycles forming in the market is because of this concept of the dual cycles running together. And so where you were expecting a trough, those cycles have slipped out of phase and you actually get a peak. It provides a whole new explanation, possible explanation, for what, in, what inverted cycles are. Okay, again, that's a, an, another huge discussion to be had at some, at some point in the future. Um, Piotr is saying, what, would, what could be the, f the factor for cycle split? Uh, what causes it? Wow, um, Piotr, I'm not sure... I, I can even begin to answer that question. Um, first of all, we need to answer the question, what causes cycles? Um, so that's a, that's a huge question. What causes the split? Um, I'd be very interested to hear what you think causes the split. Um, I, I have some ideas, 
um, but uh, I'm not going to start going into them now because it's going to take us on a tangent that could take um, several hours. But it's a, it's a very interesting question. Thank you for asking it. And um, I'm sure it's going to stimulate lots of uh, very interesting debate uh, at some point in the future. Uh, so, so let's have a look at, let's turn off these cycle lines and let's have a look at um, the composite model line. The composite model line, of course, um, all that we're doing is we are taking the cycle information uh, that is there as a result of our analysis and it's presenting it on the charts. Now, if you have a dual analysis, a trough and a peak analysis, then your composite model line includes information from both of those analyses. Okay, that's the really good news. So uh, if we zoom all the way out, here is the 54-month cycle composite model line. Um, in other words, it's a composite model built out of only the 54-month cycle. And you can see, uh, as we expect, it shows us what the 54-month cycle has been doing in this analysis. But it looks as if there, there's something wrong with it. Can you see that? What on earth happened to it over here? Well, you probably um, already... Uh, know what happened to it uh, because of the dual analysis and these dual cycles what actually happened to it was that the cycles went out of phase during that time and uh, hopefully we'll see the cycles in a moment uh, those cycles went out of phase there you can see them those cycles went out of phase there you had a peak forming simultaneously with a trough and the result is that the composite model line pretty much flatlines for the 54-month cycle during that period of time. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so your composite model line takes your analysis from your troughs, it takes your analysis from your peaks, it combines them and shows you what the combination of those two cycles were doing. And, uh, and of course, we can, we can add uh, many other uh, cycles to your uh, composite model line, and we can eventually uh, come up with a composite model uh, line that uh, matches fairly closely to what has been happening in price. Uh, I see a question from Robert. Uh, perhaps early similarities due to smart money acquiring disparate cycles equal retail investors and then again smart money at the top peak. That's a very interesting um, uh, 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 answer to Piotr's question about what makes the, um, the, the the different cycles split apart, the phasing get, get out, and uh, so possibly it's the combination of smart money and uh, retail investors and the, the different ways in which they work. Uh, very interesting uh, possibility. So uh, let's combine a whole lot of these um, uh, these cycles here and come up with a composite model line that shows uh, what this analysis is saying um, our uh, price movement should have been doing according to the cycle analysis. That's what a composite model line is, is it takes all of the cycles that you include in that model and it generates a price line, which you can then look at. And now it's time for us to start thinking about how we can use this composite model line. And we need to uh, speed up a little bit so we can get through this information um, before the end uh, of the webinar. Okay, so what do we do with a composite model line? A composite model line presents really two very distinct pieces of information. It presents information about the past, past information, and it presents information about the future. Now, those are two completely separate concepts. So let's have a look at, at that on our chart and, and understand what that means. First of all, in the past, Sentient Trader has taken all the information from this analysis at the foot of the chart and also the analysis at the top of the chart. It's combined it into a composite model line which shows us what that cycle analysis was telling us was happening in the markets according to those cycles, the cycles you've selected to include in your composite model line, including Sigma L, the sum of all longer and unknown cycle factors. So. Um, how does that past information help you? It helps you in one very simple way. 
It helps you to understand the accuracy of your analysis. You've built a model on the basis of your cyclic analysis. If that model is fairly accurate, then it will present a line that fairly accurately tracks price. You can see that this analysis is a fairly good accurate analysis because that model line is tracking along price. It is not telling us that the analysis was forecasting correctly. Please put that out of your minds. It was not telling you that at that time you would have made a fortune on, on the basis of your analysis because that's not what this line is telling us. It's telling us that according to the cycle model we have for this price movement, we have an accurate cyclic model. Or if the composite model line doesn't match closely to your price, it means you have an inaccurate composite model line and therefore you probably have a poor analysis or a bad analysis. Okay, um, so that's really what the composite model line tells us in terms of past information. But now you can see the composite model line continues into the future. So how's it doing that first of all and what does it mean? Well, uh, the way in which it does it is that Sentient Trader assumes that all cycles will return to their average wavelengths and average amplitudes. That's uh, the assumption that it makes. And it assumes that cycles will continue to beat with the same rhythm that they have been beating with. I think I said with too many times in that sentence. So um, Sentient Trader makes the assumption let me um, let's simplify these cycle lines a, a little bit. Sentient Trader makes the assumption that as we move into the future, that the cycles, let me turn off the composite model line, that the cycles will return to their average um, wavelengths and amplitudes. And that is how Sentient Trader is able to um, show you cycle lines running into the future. Okay, because it has not been able to calculate these cycle lines yet, of course. If you had a, a, a crystal ball, maybe you could uh, tell us more accurately what those cycles are going to be doing two years in the future. But what Sentient Trader does is it assumes that the cycles are going to return to their average wavelength and their average amplitude. Okay, and uh, as a result, it is able to extend the uh, composite model line into the future. Now, there's a very interesting uh, quick diversion that I want to make at this point, uh, which is a discussion of something that I call the cycle trader's paradox. And let me explain to you what the cycle trader's paradox is. Cycles, of course, that we're analyzing in the market and that we're trading are, by definition, the expression of a regularly repeating behavior. They move prices upwards and they move them downwards with a degree of regularity. That's what cycles are. Okay, we expect the 20-day cycle to keep beating with about a 20-day rhythm. So that's the second part there of the cycle traders paradox. Therefore, we expect them, the cycles, to repeat what they have done before with some variation. Now, there's that nasty word, variation. Because the principle of variation that Hurst uh, defined states that cycles are dynamic and constantly vary in wavelength and amplitude. Uh, th well, that's paraphrasing the principle of variation. That's not an exact quote. But the principle of variation tells us to expect the fact that, that cycles are constantly varying in wavelength and amplitude. So that presents us with a paradox. Why? The paradox is that we expect history to repeat because that's what cycles do, is they repeat. So we expect history to repeat, but we expect it to repeat differently. And that's the paradox that all cycle traders have to face every single day. We expect the cycles to keep repeating, but we expect them to do it differently. So uh, that presents us with the cycle traders paradox. And I mentioned at the beginning when we were looking at the disclaimers that one of these disclaimers is particularly pertinent to, to, pertinent to today's discussion and that disclaimer is of course the disclaimer about past performance which states that the past performance of any trading methodology is no guarantee of future results. I've always found that disclaimer slightly ironic because as a cycles trader you expect cycles if they worked in the past you expect them to work in the future and so that disclaimer 
um, is slightly ironic for a cycles trader because you're saying that if it happened before, then there's no guarantee of it happening uh, in in the future or happening again. Of course, I'm splitting hairs and I'm um, playing games with the semantics. The important uh, the important point in the disclaimer is that there is no guarantee. So you're not guaranteed about trading methodology. But I, I thought that was a, quite an interesting um, uh, thing to uh, to consider. Okay, so. Uh, here we go. Really time for me to uh, bring an end. I see one or two other questions. I'm going to get to them in a moment. Let me just finish the, the final little bit of information uh, that I need to get through in, in uh, today's webinar, which is how do you use the composite model line very importantly? Okay, uh, you can see I've written uh, two things down here. One is in blue. This is how you should use it. You use the composite model line to work out the time that you expect turns to happen in the market and to work out the scale of the move. Okay, so you do use it for that. You do not use it for working out price levels. Very important point. And it is the final point of, of today's webinar. So let's just quickly go and, and have a look at what that means. Let's turn off our cycle lines. Let's zoom in. We're back on the uh, chart of the S&P 500. We're trying to make some trading decisions here. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to show a composite model line and um, we're going to include lots of the shorter cycles so that we can see what this composite model line is telling us to expect. So how do we use it? What we do uh, use the composite model line for is working out the time of expected turns. So we're expecting a peak here which is in fact sometime uh, towards the end of this week or early next week we're expecting a peak. Then, we're ex then we also use that line to gather the scale of the move. How much of a move is there going to be? There's going to be quite a big move down. Then we expect a bit of flatlining perhaps and then more of a move down to this time. So there we're using the composite model line to, to determine what to expect. Okay. Uh, what we do not do with the composite model line is we don't read the price level of that and say, okay, we're expecting a peak of 2200. That is not a valid use of the composite model line. Please never do that because it's a complete waste of time because the scale of the composite model line shifts as you zoom in and out. So, uh, you know, we can even see here as we, as we zoom in, um, if we want to uh, consider things in really quite a lot of detail. We can include all the all the shorter cycles there and we can do this over here and we can see okay so what we're expecting here is another rise up to this peak and then a move down again. But we, n we never work out the the actual price levels. The other thing that I would suggest you do is that you don't um, you, you don't zoom in too far, you don't look at too much detail because the composite model lines are very good and very uh, useful tool for presenting you with the bigger picture, uh, but it's not a very useful tool for for the fine tuning of um, of 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 all of your trading decisions. Okay, so that's a, a, a an, an important point to make. Uh, one final important point to make is also don't be too specific about the timing of your turns. Here we are expecting a peak. A very important thing to do at this point is to is to say, okay, so um, what is that peak? So let's show our peak analysis. And that peak, uh, as you can see over here, is the peak of the 18-month cycle. When should I start expecting it? Well, the composite model line tells me to expect it next week over the weekend. Okay, but remember to look at your circles and whiskers and see that we could be expecting this peak already. So we should be standing by for that peak to form in the markets. I'm not saying it has formed, but we should be standing by. It is going to form soon if it hasn't already formed. Okay. Um, so there we go. I'm, I'm going to quickly answer, answer your questions. That is really um, all the information I wanted to get through in today's webinar. Let me see what uh, questions I've missed there. Um, uh, right, Najmuddin, I think that's where I, I last, last caught a question. After performing the dual analysis, does the CML explain all price movement? No, Najmuddin, it doesn't. Even after performing a dual analysis, the, the, the composite model line does not explain all price movement. There are um, influences to price movement that have nothing to do with cycles. <laughs> it might, might disappoint you, but there are other things that influence price movements. 
such as, um, well, gosh, lots of things, um, news events, fundamental events, you know, floods, um, uh, uh, weather patterns and um, political events, revolutions and so forth that influence price movements. So there are, are other things. Uh, so no, it doesn't, unfortunately. Richard, uh, it looks like now or end of June could be an important top taking place by 40-week dual analysis. Exactly, Richard. That's absolutely correct. Now um, or uh, by the end of June is certainly the time that I'm looking for a very important peak to form in the markets. So in terms of looking ahead, the, the next trade I'm really seriously thinking of making in these uh, markets is going to be a short trade, definitely. William. That is why projections in the future are inaccurate. The further you go, the more inaccurate it becomes. Absolutely, it's a very important point that I, um, I, I should have made more clearly, is that the further you move into the future, the more inaccurate your projection becomes, of course. Very, a very important point. Thank you, William. And um, Bob uh, saying he enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> Good. And my accent. Well, my accent, a uh, uh, thick South African accent. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Elizabeth, so it does not seem possible that the high of last week was the peak. Uh, Elizabeth, I think it does seem possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, be careful of focusing too much on the very fine details. The composite model line tool is great for giving you the bigger picture. Be careful of focusing on on those really tiny, tiny little details. Okay. Um, uh, the important point is we're expecting a peak before the end of June. And as you can see from these circles and whiskers, this peak um, uh, this peak is uh, pretty much due soon. It's coming now. And in fact, I know, uh, Elizabeth, you're in South Africa, and I've been looking at the South African market, and um, uh, I, I suspect the South African market is also uh, anticipating a peak. Uh, Heath says, if you're trading 40-day, what is the highest frequency cycle you would include in the cyclic model? Um, uh, Heath, uh, as a general rule, I like to look... Um, two cycles shorter than the cycle that I'm trading. However, uh, I must uh, put a sort of a disclaimer on that, um, is that if you're, if you're trading the 40-day uh, cycle, and so let's um, just have a look at this. So I would go down to 10-day. But if you're trading the 40-day cycle and you're looking at a daily analysis, as we are here, uh, where each bar is a is a daily bar, then the 10-day cycle in that composite model line is pretty useless. Okay, um, if you're working with uh, intraday charts, you've got a bit more detail in there, then you can look at uh, you can look at the 10-day as well. That, that would be my answer to that. Okay, and um, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, William. Enjoyed the presentation, Robert. You would now apply your A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H strategy in order to go short. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I would. I would apply my that that strategy. Yes. Um, so so here's the so here's the sort of summary of of that. Uh, there are various possibilities for for what's actually happening in this analysis. Um, let me see if I can find one that that matches uh, more accurately what I believe. Um, yes, let's let's work. Um, yeah, let's let's work with this chart over here just very quickly, just to answer answer that question. Um, I believe that this trough in um, when was it middle of May is actually a trough of the twenty week cycle. So here's my ABCD, the FLD trading strategy. Um, when price first crossed the twenty day FLD, which is there, that's my A category long trade. Price then dips down and touches or finds support at the FLD the 20 day fld at the level of the at the time of the 20 day cycle trough which is there that's my b category interaction price breaks up for another upward burst that's my c category interaction for many people it's an unexpected sudden you know surge to a new peak what we're looking at now in my opinion which happened on fr on friday and is basically playing out as we speak is potentially a d category interaction as price comes down into the 40 day cycle trough at which point it will go up and cross up in an e and so on and so forth i hope that answers that question uh, robert but th that is what i would be looking at and um 
So uh, with that, I think that's um, answered all of those questions. Thank you very much for joining me uh, today in the Hearst Trading Room. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for your interest in Hearst Cycles. I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Our next webinar uh, will be in uh, two weeks. Uh, so make sure that you come along to that webinar. Uh, sorry for throwing so much new information at you all in the space of just over an hour, but um, I really hope that you find it uh, very useful. And as always, I wish you profitable trading, and I look forward to seeing you next time.